This is a presentation of BSRN, Box Studios Radio Network. The Power Play Post Show is on the air, covering minor league hockey since 2003, and now covering the Binghamton Black Bears, with news, reactions, and in-depth interviews only heard here. And now, from the Box Studios in Kirkwood, New York, here is your host of the Power Play Post Show, Bob Howard. And hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Power Play Post Show. This is the show for February 15th, 2024. Uh, we are in season 13, and this is episode number 23 and episode number 408 in the long running podcast that is the Power Play Post Show. I am your host, Bob Howard. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in uh, this Thursday. And I'm actually recording this segment the night before, as I normally do, but a little bit later in the evening because the Binghamton Black Bears just finished a game in Elmira, New York, and I wanted to get reaction, like immediate reaction right afterwards um, about this game. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've already spoken to uh, head coach Brant Sherwood, And this is the quote from Brandt. It was fantastic to see them rally together and get back in the win column, proud of these guys, quote, unquote. Uh, That was the reaction from head coach Binghamton Black Bears, Brandt Sherwood, just a couple minutes ago after the game had completed, uh, say about 20, 22 minutes ago. Um, And I got that reaction from him. Uh, we got a lot to go over in uh, just from the game, 10-2 win for the Binghamton Black Bears. We got a great guest in Nolan Egbert will be here um, to talk about his journey so far as a pro hockey player and, of course, growing up on Long Island. Very good interview. I hope you guys really enjoy it. Um, but uh, let's get right into it. The Power Play Post Show is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio. Just search Power Play Post Show on whichever platform you listen to your podcast, and please subscribe. Please join the Power Play Post Show Facebook group. Just go to Facebook and search for the Power Play Post Show and share with all of your friends. Now, the nice thing is uh, we are getting two or three, sometimes more than that, new uh, group members, and I appreciate you guys joining uh, check out the BinghamtonHockey.net for all your Binghamton Hockey information and curiosity. And on this edition of the Power Play Post Show, I am very happy to have on Binghamton Black Bears netminder, our second goalie from the team, Nolan Egbert. So that's going to be a really great interview. I'm really excited for you guys to be able to listen to that in just a little bit. But let's talk about what we just all witnessed and watched. And if you didn't watch, you're hearing it here. Um, this is the breakdown of Wednesday night scheme with the Elmira River Sharks. Now, uh, the the River Sharks and the Black Bears, the game ended a 10-2 victory for the Binghamton Black Bears. As we most of us who watched or, or, or saw the game, Connor Smith did score four goals. We'll get through all of that here in just a little bit. Uh, both teams played with only 13 skaters and two goalies. So even the Elmira River Sharks who didn't have to do that because of suspensions for the Binghamton Black Bears. Uh, They were just in a, you know, crunch when it came to uh, players. They even had an emergency backup goalie um, in net, uh, which Tyler Jurich obviously did not know the rule, which is you can't pull that goalie unless your starting goalie is injured. That has been a rule that's been around for a long time. Now, if you're curious on why that is to be that way, Um, Why is that rule in place? Well, that's because usually emergency backup goalies are either coming from a um, like a college team. Sometimes it's a college team. Sometimes it's a, uh, you know, an equipment manager that has suits up as a goalie. And they're not necessarily prepared to play pro hockey. So in the American Hockey League, if you have a guy, um, and I know Binghamton addressed a, a, an emergency backup goalie a few different times, and I think he worked out of Amira, and he was like either the goalie coach or something for 
um, the college team in Elmira. I can't remember exactly. I'll have to get the details and get that information out to you guys. But he would come in and be the emergency backup goalie in Binghamton. Well, you cannot take that guy who is not playing with the team, not practicing with the team. He's usually also not affecting the roster limits. You can't just go and you know pull you know put him in just because your goalie's having a bad day. Um, it, it's it's unsafe really to the emergency backup goalie because in some cases they haven't had time to really prepare and be ready uh, for it. So that's that's with that being said, that's why that rule is kind of in place. There's a you know a couple different points to that rule and why that's that way. So either way, both teams, thirteen skaters, two goalies. Um, Binghamton obviously did so because of Gavin Yates and Bryce Farrell uh, suspensions costing him a roster spot each. And the third missing player was because Thomas Ray and Nikita Voshkin did not dress or travel with the team. We'll get to that in a little bit after um, we talk about this game. Connor McAnanima was in net for the Black Bears, and River Sharks had Eli Bowers in net. Sammy Bernard did not dress. Now, he was the goalie of record in Sunday's game, and he did not play or dress for this game. I expected him to be there. Uh, I do not know why he did not dress. So Eli Bowers uh, did dress and was the goalie of record in this game, at least through the first two periods before a injury of sort happened in the locker room. He may have slipped and fell. We don't know, folks. We don't want to question the integrity of the, the game and or of you know Tyler Jurich, but apparently there was an injury found on Eli Bowers during the uh, second intermission, and he did not come out and play the third period. In the first period with uh, Sertorios, I'm not going to pronounce his last name. We'll call him Sertorios K. I like that. In the penalty box for diving, the Binghamton Black Bears uh, picked up the first, the game's first goal, a power play goal at 11.37 and into the first period from Josh Fletcher, Connor Smith, and Dan Stone had the assist. Now, Connor Smith was not credited with an assist on that. Um, but it came from him, so I don't know. Uh, former Black Bears player Brett Parker scoring as well on the power play um, to tie the game at one with Connor Smith in the penalty box for slashing. We will say Connor Smith's name a lot in this recap, okay? Um, but it was tied 1-1 after one period of play, right? And it seems like these teams both being down on players, you know, only dressing 13 skaters and two goalies, both teams, it seemed like this was going to be this kind of game, maybe a close game between these two teams. We already saw Elmira win three games just the other, um, just this past weekend. They won three games in a row, two against Danbury, one at home, one on the road, and then back home against the Binghamton Black Bears. They won on Sunday. So I thought the first period was played decently well. I think the Black Bears had better chances and more chances. They were leading in shots after the first period. But I thought Elmira kept themselves in it. Then the second period happened. And the second period was all Black Bears. Completely all Black Bears. Um, The Black Bears uh, regained the lead. And more importantly, Connor Smith put the puck into the back of the net uh, at the 418 mark of the second period. And I say more importantly, and that's because he's kind of been a little inconsistent. And we need, uh, the Black Bears really need Somebody to step forward and be that offensive leader. Tyson Kirkby's been very, very good. Don't get me wrong. But we need somebody else to also step up, uh, especially seeing in the decline production of Nikita Ivashkin. Now, the assist on the Connor Smith goal was Jesse Anderson and Taylor McCloy. He was getting Jesse Anderson's nine-point game uh, or nine-game point streak was extended. And, of course, Taylor McCloy's uh, first point as a black bear. Okay, Connor Smith then scored his second goal of the period four minutes and eight seconds later, putting the Black Bears up 3-1 at the 8.26 mark. Uh, assist went to Dean Weber on that, who you will hear from again in a little bit. Uh, with Liam Anderson in the box for slashing and with the River Sharks on the power play, the Binghamton Black Bears uh, forward Josh Fletcher stole the puck and scored shorthanded at the 11.35 mark, and gave the Black Bears a 4-1 lead. There was no assist on that. Uh, Connor Smith wasted no time and scored his hat-trick goal um, 
His his third goal of the period, and of course the hat trick goal, just one minute and fifty four seconds after the Fletcher goal, making this a five one game. The assist went to Tyson Kirkby on that. I believe Kirkby is going to end up with three assists in this game. The Black Bears were not done in the period, scoring their fifth goal of the period off the stick of Jesse Anderson. Four thirteen left to go in the period. That was also an unassisted goal. Now, Tyler Jurich, at this point, tried to put in Chris Marcello, um, the emergency backup goalie, after the sixth goal. But the refs would not allow it because the starter in this situation needs to be actually injured. Again, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I don't think Tyler Jurich, either Tyler Jurich didn't know the rule or he was just really doing whatever he could. Now, the referees keep an eye on goalies, right? I think it's something that they are very conscious of. You know, do they see, you know, a goalie tweak himself and they're kind of working it out? Sometimes goalies will actually alert the the team benches. So I, I have a feeling that, you know, Eli Bowers probably didn't show any indications that he was injured. So the referees didn't buy it and were like, listen, Tyler, you, you – He's not injured, okay? So that wasn't it for the Black Bears. Tyson Kirkby scored his first goal of the game and the Black Bears' sixth goal of the game, fifth of the period, I believe it was. 47 uh, seconds left into the second period, and mercifully, the period ends with the Black Bears now leading 7-1. to So that was their sixth goal of the period. Assists on that were Taylor McCloy, and that was his sixth, second assist and point of the game and second point of his Binghamton Black Bears career. Now, third period came around, and Connor Smith started it right off uh, about halfway through the period, uh, continuing his scoring ways, um, 9.20 into the third period with his fourth goal of the game, giving the Black Bears a seven-goal lead. The assist went to Dakota Bond and Andrew Utoro. Now, this was also the only the second time a Binghamton Black Bears player has scored four goals in a game. Nikita Avashkin did it in the first season. Uh, Liam Anderson then got on the score sheet for the Black Bears during our scoring the ninth goal of the game uh, with 9.15 left to go in the game. Assist went to Andrew, Andrew Utoro and Tyson Kirkby. Um, Darius Davidson gets the River Sharks' second goal of the game, also on the power play with J.T. Walters in the box for tripping. Now, that was the second goal for the Elmira River Sharks and second power play goal. So they scored only on the power play in this game. The Black Bears get their 10th goal of the game off the stick of Dan Weber, who scored off a booming shot with 327 left to go in the game. Black Bears just dominated. Uh, On that goal, uh, assist by Dan Stone and Tyson Kirkby. That was Kirkby's third assist of the game. Now, notes about this game. The Black Bears' magic number now is 18 points. That's a combination of points that... Uh, either Watertown loses or the Black Bears pick up. So if they get six more wins in regulation, they're in regardless of what Watertown does. The Black Bears tonight win in the corners. They won most of the battles in all three zones, and that is a key to success. They never stopped skating. I, I got to be honest with you, they were down basically three players, right? If you can dress 18 and you have 13 and uh, 13 and two, which is 15 players. You know, with your two goalies, you're down three three forwards, two forwards, maybe a defenseman. What, however, you want to work out those numbers. They were down three guys. That means guys were playing extra minutes, and it didn't seem to affect them. They took a team that had all the confidence coming in, all the confidence. The, understand that they had all the confidence coming in. Elmira did. They knew that Black Bears were going to be shorthanded. They were shorthanded, but they figured, hey, we just beat them. And the Black Bears, uh, you know, took that that game and uh, really uh, took advantage of the whole thing. Now, let's look at the standings just for a second because the standings obviously are going to be updated. The Binghamton Black Bears now have 25 wins on the season. They are 25, 5, and 6 for 80 points. So they are the second team to make it to the 80-point mark with Columbus uh, being there already from the past weekend or so. All right, so Columbus has 83 points. Uh, Columbus is really good. They've also played three less games than the Binghamton Black Bears. So I expect Columbus to continue their winning ways and whatnot. Now, Myra 
dropped to a uh, thirteen twenty three and zero with thirty seven points. But the most important thing is we broke the winning streak of the Elmira uh, River Sharks, and we obviously broke our losing streak of two games. So that's that's where we stand right there. And what a game, right? I mean, what a comeback after everything um, that happened over this past weekend and maybe even some of the news that I'm about to talk about. Now, I'm not going to go into complete details. Um, Obviously, if you were paying attention to this game, you know that Nikita Ivashkin and Thomas Ray were listed as scratches for tonight. Well, let's talk a little bit about what's going on. The Binghamton Black Bears roster issue, okay? Two players noticeably absent from last night's game. So the game uh, between Elmira and, of course, uh, Binghamton. Nikita Ivashkin and Thomas Ray. And here's why. It will be announced that Thomas Ray has been released by the team. I'm not going to go into all the details of the things that were told to me, but he will be released by the team. Um, I'm actually kind of surprised that as I'm recording this on Wednesday night that it hasn't been released yet. Um, There might be, you know, talks of with other general managers and coaches of, you know, maybe a trade or whatever. But I don't I don't think that's going to happen. Ray and Coach Sherwood could not agree on the continued development for Ray. And the decision was made to release him. I can tell you from my conversation with Coach Sherwood that he had a lot invested in Ray and was very upset about this when I spoke to him on Tuesday. Okay, This was not taken lightly. This was not an easy decision at all. That's all I'm going to say about it. He will be released. All right, Um, Nikita Ivashkin is no longer with the team as well. Um, That situation hasn't been completely resolved in the sense of how the roster space will be freed up. So I'm going to leave it as that. At some point after the Sunday Elmira game, Nikita went off the radar and was not at the mandatory practice on Tuesday. Nikita was communicating with Andreas only. What his status will be is unknown until some things get worked out, but it is not expected that Nikita will be back with the team and his time with the Black Bears is over. It's that simple. All right, so those two players um, you're probably not going to see again on a with a Binghamton Black Bears uniform. Now, how the Nikita Ivashkin roster spot is handled, not sure yet. Um, there's still a value in that. Now, there's a couple things you can think about here. Um, recently, Nikita had been playing on not the, you know, As Coach Sherwood likes to talk about, he doesn't like to talk about lines as being one, two, and three, right? Because it sounds like the first line is the best line, the second line is... Now, that is talked about a lot in hockey, right? Um, Nikita was playing on what you would consider the third line. And Nikita does sometimes need to have a a player on him that really kind of picks him up. Now, he's got so, so much skill when he's on the ice, you would think that... The, um, the, the he would have the ability to pick up others. But it seems like when he plays with like someone like Mac Lewis or Brendan Stinko from earlier this season, his abilities get picked up by those guys. He doesn't pick up the, the other guys. He was asked to work on defense, and he was doing that. And Coach Sherwood thought he was getting better defensively. So I'm going to leave it with that. We will see these transactions happen. Um, Listen, the guys were not there on Wednesday night against Elmira. It's pretty easy to put the dots together. I'm not telling you anything that isn't going to come out um, realistically. And the other details that are involved in both of these situations, I'm going to leave it at that. The second thing about Nikita Ivashkin, and that is a lot of people have to realize, and, and when guys are playing at this level and making the money that they are, uh, when they start to you know have a family and you know, and Nikita is uh, going to be a father um, soon. Sometimes the priority of, of taking care of the family is more important than playing hockey. I'm going to leave that as that because I don't know if that's completely the only reason why he's not playing with the Black Bears at the moment or maybe even in the future. So that's that. That's coming out. You're going to hear that from me, and then you're going to see that going forward, okay? Um it sucks, I think, for the Black Bears to have two very talented players not 
be on the team, but it is what it is, and you just have to move on. They have other very talented players that are going to be joining this team, and that's how you have to look at it. You have to move forward and look at what happened on Wednesday night. The Binghamton Black Bears won 10-2 to two shorthanded without those two guys. Would it have been 12 or 14, or maybe it could have been six or seven goals that they scored because the dynamic is different. Now, you have to remember, perception is a lot, right? Sometimes teams don't tell you all the information for a reason. So, moving on. Now, Jake Schultz did travel with the team to Elmira on Wednesday night, though he's not ready to play yet, but he could be back for the game against Watertown on the 23rd. Donald Dottle, very same situation. He will be taking off the IR sometime within the next few days, and will be back with the team on the 23rd as well. More players will start to trickle in as college seasons start to end. Coach has about seven potential players coming in from the college ranks. Right, This is where we found some of the great players that we see right now. Brendan Stinko, Connor Smith, they all came from college at the end of last season. And it is very possible that Mac Lewis, Matthew Ballard, and Justin Samaro will be back before the playoffs. Okay, Now, those are three names that were basically told to me that we know Mac Lewis is taking care of some uh, family personal stuff, right? Having a kid of his own, and he could definitely be back. He and Brant Sherwood have been in contact. That's the important thing. Matthew Ballard and Justin Samaro, they're up playing in the SP, and what coach has been telling me is that there's the potential that they could come back. Our roster is going to be fine. Guys come and go. This is the Federal Prospects Hockey League. This is not the AHL. This is not the NHL. Guys are going to come and go because of their of, of their own situation that they have to take care of. We can't blame the coach staff. We can't blame the other teammates or whatever. All we can do is look at the situation and move forward. At least that's what the team can do. You know, I can talk about whatever I want and say whatever I want. Um, but again, that is their situation with the roster. It seems light right now. Now, the other thing you got to look at is Gavin Yates um, getting that penalty on Sunday. This is a key thing that the Black Bears know that they have to correct. They have to stop getting these multi-game suspensions, losing roster spots. That's not a good thing. And you don't want to go into the playoffs being down a roster spot too because I could see that hurting a very good team in the playoffs. The playoffs are a different animal, as we all know. Anyone who's watched hockey playoffs, we all know how different uh, the hockey playoffs are versus playing in the regular season. So the Black Bears need to clean that up. Gavin Yates, obviously, you know, he, he feels bad about it. He knows it. He, he did a dumb move. That is not something that you want to be known for, kicking a player and whatnot. So that is that. That is the roster situation. Now, after tonight, Bryce Farrell can come back. So that's a key thing here, right? Bryce Farrell on the 23rd can come back and play with the Black Bears. We go back to 17 roster spots from the 16 that we were at on Wednesday night, back up to 17, four games then after the next four games, which now you have to remember in a week when they come back, in nine days when they come back, they have another three games and three nights. Right, so we have to we have to look at. There's a few of those coming up and everything, and we have. But the 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 23rd, the 24th, and the 25th, Binghamton is at home against Watertown on the 23rd and the 24th, and on the 25th they go on the road. Okay, so they there is there is tough times ahead schedule wise, but the roster is going to get better, and we'll have Bryce Farrell back. And Bryce Farrell, we all know, is a fast, speedy guy. He's got experience up in the SP. And he is going to help this team as well as Taylor McCloy, who got his first two assists tonight. All right. So that's pretty much it. That's all I want to talk about. Um, coming up next here on the Power Play Post Show is a great interview with Nolan Egbert. And we'll be right back right after this, right here on the Power Play Post Show. Hi, this is Don Biggs from the 92-93 Binghamton Rangers. Hi, this is Brandon Bochinski. This is Grady Wittenberg, the voice of the Binghamton Senators, and you're listening to the Power Play Post Show. <laughs> The 
Here is another Power Play Post Show interview exclusive with Bob Howard. And welcome back, everybody, to the Power Play Post Show. Uh, very excited to have this gentleman on. I've actually talked to him a couple times, you know, here and there, outside uh, of the locker room, inside the locker room a little bit, and I really wanted to get him here on the show uh, to talk a little bit about his career and his life a little bit. He is uh, Binghamton Black Bears uh, netminder, Nolan Egbert. Nolan, welcome to the show. Great to have you on, and it's, it's been a pleasure to got, get to know you a little bit, and we have some similar interests and everything, which is pretty cool, but thank you very much for coming on. I'm happy to be here. It's, uh, it's good to talk to you in a setting that's not the not the uh, the rink atmosphere. Get to speak one-on-one a bit more. Absolutely. Now, you are from North Massapequa, which some people might recognize the name, but it, it is out on Long Island and everything. Can you talk a little bit about Because it's in the smack middle, I think, of, of, of really Long Island and everything. Can you talk a little bit about uh, North Massapequa and what it's what kind of like, it, to me, from what I looked at on the, on the thing, looks like a suburb, basically, right? Yeah, so we're right next to uh, to Levittown. If you know your American history, uh, the first suburb, it's uh, it's basically an extension of that. It says, it, I hate to say white bread Americana as you could get, but it's uh, but it's simple. It's nice, and as far as location, I'm only about fifteen twenty minutes from every major rink on the island. So it means my phone call gets blown up a lot during the off season for guys needing a goaltender. So th- I was just going to ask you, how many rinks do you think are around there? Because what people have to understand is, is you know, to the west a little bit, you've got obviously the New York Rangers uh, to to the to the you know, and then of course you had the New York Islanders on the island for the longest time and everything. So without a doubt, hockey is a big thing on the island, right? And there's a lot of rinks. Yeah. So it's uh, as hockey is really in the majority of. The United States, not so Canada, obviously, it's being king there. It's the uh, it's a healthy alternating number three, number four sport where everyone's aware of it. Everyone keeps a, a general beat on it. No one's surprised you are a hockey player, but it's not uh, ubiquitous. Uh, but you know, without a doubt, there is a lot of rinks out on the island. A lot of places for you to yeah, be able absolutely. to go and get ice time. Yeah, so it's. Uh, I would say in my immediate vicinity, there's probably about seven, eight total, just off the top of my head. That's pretty impressive if you think. And of... that's around me. It's... Yeah, really, that's the whole island. There's likely more. Yeah, I mean, there's that, but that's pretty impressive though if you think about it. From your parents' house, how far do you think you'd have to drive to get to the closest rink? Uh, that would be about ten minutes. Yeah, so that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, growing up. Obviously, on the island, was there was there a lot of opportunities for you to play? You know, hockey, baseball, football. What sports were you into when you were like definitely, you know, a youngster? Uh, so hockey was always my first love. My, it's always uh, hockey. My dad and uncle were Islanders season ticket holders since the early '90s, so they were taking me into the building before I even understood what was going on. They would. Uh, they would consistently lie to me about the outcome of the games just because how abysmal the Islanders were in the 90s to make sure I stayed interested and didn't consider joining my uh, my mom's side of the family, which were all Ranger fans. Oh, wow. Oh, okay, so you lived in a household where mom was a Rangers fan and dad was an Islanders fan. So I got to ask you. A real Romeo and Juliet story. Yeah, no, really. Honestly, it is. Okay, so I have to ask you. Are you uh, dad's best friend or are you mommy's little boy? Because, you know, I'm a Rangers fan, so you can't. I'm literally wearing a Binghamton Rangers jer- uh, uh, sweatshirt right now as we're talking. So the question is did you grow up a, an Islanders fan or a Rangers fan? Oh, Islanders all the way. My dad had a t- held a tight grip on that. It was, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, when you have a, have a family dynamic like that, but like uh, if. Uh, Two sons and daughters of the uh, Hatfields and McCoys tried to to get together. Uh, the house can get a bit hostile at times, but uh, no, I was always an Islanders fan. But that's not to say I didn't appreciate the the hockey on display with like the Rangers, the the great pedigree of goaltending they had. I wear thirty five because of Richter. Believe it or not, 
Oh, okay. So you're paying a little bit homage to your mom's love of the Rangers. Mike Richter, obviously, as everybody knows, was the uh, 1994 um, uh, New York Ranger who won, obviously, the Stanley Cup. The last time we actually – well, it's not the last time we sniffed it. Obviously, 2015, I think, was the last time when we lost to the L.A. – 14, to the L.A. Kings. And everything, um, which was a great, great playoffs. That was, I mean, that that playoffs was great for both the Kings and the Rangers. Obviously, the uh, Rangers came up short and everything. Um, but yeah, what a it, show of goaltending that was! It was. It, no. Both ends, Lundqvist and Quick were both at their peaks. It was as much as I was dreading the fact that the Rangers were that close. It was still you had to appreciate it as a hockey fan. I love that. You're not even happy for your mom at that point. You're just like, you know, nope, I'm an Islanders fan. See, this is, see, fans, this is what's beautiful about Islanders fans and Ranger fans. It doesn't matter if they live in the household with you. You just can't root for them because the Islanders and the Rangers just can't coexist. Now, of course, your mom and dad obviously coexisted, but it's one of those things where you just you have a hard time rooting for the other team. Um, what about, I mean, because realistically, I mean, you had some pretty good influences when it came to, obviously, goaltending. Because you also had, you know, New Jersey Devers, uh, Devils had, obviously, Martin Brodeur. I mean, there's definitely, certainly, what people, I, I think, I mean, you, you can speak to more to this being, you know, f- uh, from the island, close to New York City, obviously close to Newark and everything. Um I think I think our area has been pretty lucky to have so much great goaltending in the last thirty or forty years. Yeah, I mean it was again frustrating as an Islanders fan to watch sure. uh, the Devils have Brodor, uh, New York, almost seamlessly transition from Richter to Lundqvist, and our the Islanders' poor savior in DiPietro's body just collapsed, and it was it was like okay, well, that's about our luck, isn't it? How good do you think DiPietro could have been if his body did not give out? Oh, he was, uh, I mean, even when I was younger, you could recognize he was getting better on a nightly basis. Like, people really don't remember his brief prime as, again, as brief as it was. Sure. But he was the only reason the Islanders were even remotely relevant between, I would say, 2003 to eight when he finally, when his, his knees and hips gave out. And, uh, oh, the infamous, uh, All Star Game clip where you could hear him mic'd up say, "Oh my God, I think I just blew out my hip," mm-hmm. and then that was like a year into that fifteen year contract, and every Islander fan points to that moment like, oh, "Okay, there's the moment where uh, where it all came crashing down." Nolan, how quickly did your parents have you guys have you on skates? Uh well, fairly early, I would say. My, uh, I think I was doing. Uh, I would have been on actual skates maybe around three, four years old, but I was on rollerblades before that. Oh, really? And yeah, I rollerbladed before anything else just for a matter of convenience, I think, to try and teach me to skate without needing to pay for ice. <laughs> yeah, well, you pay for ice, uh, paying for ice is sometimes expensive and everything. Um, how quickly in your youth hockey did you know that goal, it was, you were going to be a goalie? Oh, the moment I fell in love with goaltending the moment I really began to understand hockey. My first really? favorite goaltender was uh, was Chris Osgood, and mm-hmm. he had a brief year and a half stint with the Islanders. And yeah. it was just the moment I saw like him playing on the ice, I was like, I want to do that. He never leaves the ice. He's got the coolest gear on. Yeah. And it was it was over from that point. Not without my uh, without my dad trying to fight back against any chance he got. This this past he was, week, uh, not happy. Yeah, this past weekend, you made one of those crazy like post to post kind of saves. You're down on your side. You're you're reaching out and everything, and you made this really amazing save. Was there a goaltender that you watched as a kid that would kind of you know like that kind of save? It reminded you of that, you know, that type of thing. Because you know, some guys either will do that or they can't do that or don't even try to do that. And it was just like you went from one side to the other side. You were on your side reaching out. It was like a Superman uh, dive kind of. Now, I made my own mess on that one. I uh, mm. bring it back to Di Pietro. I'm no, uh, I'm no Di Pietro when it comes to playing the puck. I uh, just didn't get enough on it and turn that what should have been a fairly standard play into a two-on-one the other way. But uh, 
Uh, again, once again, rounding back to DPS, I was watching some old highlights of the game from him in 2007. I think it was against Toronto, and he made a, a Superman save like that. So, I mean, I wasn't trying to emulate anyone at that point. That was just yeah. a matter of, oh, God, i got to get something back there in time, and it ended up in the glove. Yeah, and, and, and what's amazing about it is, like, it's instinct. You have to think about that within a second or two to make the decision that you have to do that, right? Yeah, goaltending is uh, strange at times where you watch the video of it and it goes by so quickly, but time almost seems to move in slow, slow. motion when you're really in a uh, in those quick moments like that. Uh, I mean, it's There's only 60 minutes of on-ice time, but it, it really feels like uh, just ages as you're actually doing it. What's 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 youth hockey like on on the island? Is it are you traveling a lot, or is there enough local stuff that you can actually stay very close to home and still play competitive hockey? So when I was younger, it was we had a fairly a fairly healthy amount of competition on Long Island, where you could stay relatively regional, maybe going as far as New Jersey. Sure. Uh, consistently, or Connecticut, upstate New York, or to a Long Island where everything is upstate New York because they're about yeah. as low as it gets. Yeah. But uh, no, it's, no, it's, nowadays, sure. uh, from what I've talked to uh, to people, is now uh, you'll get these super teams that just travel mm. all season long, like for everywhere. It's uh, the financial commitment has to be just astounding with what they're putting into it, but they. Uh, the talent out of Long Island it just speaks for itself, though. So clearly, they're doing something right. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know the Black Bears have done a little bit of work with the Broome County High School team that's kind of come together from all different schools and everything. Uh, I think you guys were over at the uh, the farm at the big rink on uh, at the at the farm and everything, and uh, helping helping those kids. It seems like that's becoming kind of like a norm, right? Take the best of this area, this high school, best of this high school, put together a super team, and then go and travel. I think it also. I think nowadays it kind of highlights those players that are probably going to go far anyways. Um, whereas if you're, you know, if you got six or seven schools playing against each other, it may not be as impressive as having that super team. It's a change in the way sports and, you know, hockey especially has gone. Yeah, so it, these super teams do exist. But I know you want to talk about it a little later, the difference between, say, Minnesota and Long Island hockey, but... Uh... But AAA is king on Long Island. Like high school is generally just a, a hobby on the side that mm-hmm. some guys will do to uh, just to say that they've done it or to show off to their friends in a way. But uh, no, yeah, you have these super uh, these consolidated AAA teams, and they'll uh, and they'll keep them together for a while just to uh, to really you know develop the players, uh, almost academy like in a way. Yeah, and. It's clearly paying off. I know uh, a kid I've been skating with uh, during the off season the past two years. Uh, James Higgins is supposed to. He's projected to go first overall in 2025. So that's crazy. And a bunch of other top end prospects. You know, so I, whatever they're doing, I can't argue with it. It's it's amazing too because I, I know like you know even the Binghamton Black Bears, like literally there's somebody from each coast. You know, you got Tommy Ray who's from Florida. You've got obviously your Michigan and, and Minnesota guys, um, California kid on on the team. You're as far kind of, I guess, east as you can be, really, being from from Long Island. You know, just thirty or forty years ago, we talked about how seventy, eighty percent of the players that were playing pro hockey were Canadian, and now. Just in the NHL, it's that number is down to 42% for Canadians because the American growth of hockey has just changed. And, you know, you just have better development here in America than you've ever had. And Sweden, I think, is like 9% in third place and everything. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you've seen 
from just talking to Tommy Ray and being able to talk to all these different players from around the country, you know, because in in, in Massachusetts, you have prep school hockey, right? In, you know, in Minnesota and Michigan, hockey in high school and the travel teams are totally different than what maybe you have here in upstate New York or even on Long Island. There is a culture of hockey all throughout this country, and now that we're getting players from California, we're getting players from Florida, it's really changed the thought process of where can I pull from, where can I recruit from, where can I develop hockey players. Pretty much it's everywhere in the country now. Oh, the growth of the game in the United States has been astonishing. I mean, obviously I'm a younger guy, but I'm very much into the history of the game. Uh, I mean, you could trace that American boom, like, the lineage back to the Miracle on Ice, and then the next generation got to see the World Cup team in 96 uh, beat Canada. And then my generation got to see, they didn't win, but get to uh, overtime at the 2010 Olympics. Uh, It's been such a... uh, The growth of the game in the United States has been something that definitely should be studied, uh, maybe a bit deeper than it has been. Uh, maybe try and get into words what uh, how it's actually occurred. But I think the difference between the United States and Canada is Canada may have a bit of a monoculture when it comes to to hockey, where there's like almost one path to to go to get as far as you want to go in the sport. Whereas in the United States, you mentioned it yourself, uh, like uh, Massachusetts has the prep schools, Minnesota leads with high school hockey. The New York area is more in the AAA sort of yeah area of development. There's yep. so many different ways that uh, players come up that you get these Swiss Army Knife players or you can make these Swiss Army Knife teams where someone from the United States has a completely different development cycle than someone else, and you could, there's so much different talent to pull from. It's amazing, too, because, you know... You- Major juniors, you know the you know the Canadian Hockey League up there with the OHL and the WHL and the the Q. You you put all those together, and then you have collegiate hockey here in in the states. NCAA Division One hockey is now starting to produce NHLers like you wouldn't believe. D three hockey, D D two, all these levels of hockey, uh, the uh, you know ACHA, you know producing hockey players that can play competitively. At all levels of pro hockey now, it's it's amazing when you take a look at where a hockey player can come from, and it can be different for every single player on the team. Oh yeah, it's. Uh, I think we spoke about it earlier, uh, just separately. But yeah, the growth of the ACHA or the ACHA is all the uh, yeah. the guys like to kind of abbreviate down to. It's. Uh, the fact that you could find real genuine talent at that level now, whereas maybe 15 years ago it wasn't really respected very much, speaks to everything we were saying about how United States hockey has just absolutely grown exponentially. It, there's so much talent to go around that you're not exclusively looking at these top-end D1 schools or D3 schools to find a capable hockey player. It can really come from any level of collegiate hockey now. Now, you played, obviously, four years, basically four years, NCAA, uh, D3, UMass Boston. Um, You didn't get as much playing time there as you did with uh, SUNY Brockport. But talk about the competitiveness of D3 hockey. I joke here on the show about maybe some of you D3 guys going against the Asha guys and, you know, because you got Adrian Bulldogs all over the place on the Binghamton uh, Black Bears, some actually from the from the uh, Adrian school actually call us the Binghamton Bulldogs, uh, which I think is funny, (laughs) but you know, talk about, you know, you're on the same team. There are other D three guys here in Binghamton, uh, Gavin Yates and others, Tyson Kirkby all played in the uh, SUNY act system. Um, Can you talk a little bit about, uh, do you think that, you know, the Brendan Stankos, the Connor Smith, the Dakota bonds are the, they, to me, it doesn't seem like they are, because it's club hockey or considered club hockey, it, it, to me, it doesn't seem like it's inferior to D3 hockey. Now, like, uh, there's no black and white answer to right. the separation between, I think it's a sliding scale, whereas 
you will find a bottom end D3 team that just will not be able to hold a candle to Adrian Club. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you'll find a a relatively average Asha team just yeah. wouldn't be able to to keep up with, say, a, a bottom end uh, Suniac team. But that also might not be the case. It's you're, you're never going to find a specific answer to that. There's the talent level is just varied enough where. You need to look at it on a team by team basis. And what's interesting about some of these college teams as well is that Adrian does have a D three team, right? And you know you mm-hmm. have different levels of the club team, so it's it's pretty amazing how uh, how compli- I, I won't say almost complicated, but complex um, NCAA or even Asha hockey is in in the states that there are so many different levels of it and they provide a different avenue for almost every t- different level of hockey player out there. Yeah, so I think a lot of the uh, the fact that Adrian is so capable at the, the club level to put out talent the way they do is the fact that their D3 team is always always considered a front runner or at the very least a, one of the favorites to walk away with the national tournament championship at the D3 level that they have the ability to put out a club team that's equal to a, a vast amount of the field of regular D3 schools. So there should be no surprise that they're able to send players such as such as Stanko that we saw to levels like the SPHL and probably beyond. You, you think? Do you think we're going to have a club? A club guy who played club hockey, do you think it's possible to get a club hockey guy maybe even to the ECHL or AHL level someday? Oh, absolutely. I don't think it's a – I think it's a matter of when more than anything else. I mean, just uh, – I mean, you want to go back uh, like 15 years ago, it would have been inconceivable for a Division three player to get a sniff at the, the AHL or NHL, but you'll have a guy like uh, – Keith Coin comes to mind yes. right now where he was a, a Norwich cadet and he yep. had a lengthy career in the AHL and had a sizable amount of time in the NHL as well. So there's nothing to say that the level the guy is coming from is going to be able to, to find where their feeling is. That's amazing. You mentioned Keith Coin, former Power Play Post Show alum. He was here on the show. I interviewed him at three or four of the All Star games in the AHL because he was always good enough. And uh, you know, he played in the UHL as well. He's one of the few guys in the UHL, the old UHL, the old U-Haul League, as they like to call it, that actually played in the NHL as well because you really couldn't define it on the league that they were coming from, but the player itself and everything, which is very interesting. Um, talk to me a little bit about Brockport, um, just outside of uh, Rochester, uh, where that school is, and everything. Uh, talk to me about your time there and what you learned about yourself as a goaltender there. Uh, so, when I left uh, UMass Boston, it was uh, under the, gu- the the pretense that I knew it was a combination of I, the city life didn't vibe very well with me. At least the city of Boston didn't. Uh, I had nothing against it personally; it just wasn't mm-hmm. for me. But uh, being able to go to a smaller town uh, was a big thing for my personal life. I think that went out to the ice. It helped me kind of ease into it, especially, too, with the fact that we did very well attendance-wise with Brockport, at least comparatively to UMass Boston, which seems a bit strange. Uh, being in a big city or a big school, you would think more people would come, but wasn't the case. Uh, no, but Brockport taught me it was, uh, I guess, how to be it how to be a consistent goaltender because the, obviously the, the, the SUNY schedule, the college schedule isn't a, a professional schedule where all your time is dedicated to making sure you're ready for game day or for practice. But uh, you learn to consolidate what little things you need to, to be ready to play at a moment's notice or to be ready to practice or to back up or to start whatever game you're going to do. And I think that's really played well into why I, th- I think I've been able to play a lot of road games this year mm-hmm. just because I think it's, you know, the the flexibility and getting ready for a game. Like a lot of goaltenders are slaves to habits, but as long as you don't become that slave to it, you can adapt very well. And Brockport helped teach me that. I think that was just a general D3 college thing, though. I don't think that was particular to Brockport. 
Now, did any of you guys, when you were there, obviously, did you go? Did, did any of you guys go to the Rochester American Games? Oh uh, yeah, I went to a few of them. It was uh, it was very nice to have such a uh, high level of hockey nearby to to watch on watch cheaply more than anything else. Cause <laughs> it's not like we had uh, that much money to spend on right. uh, on everything else. But I went to a lot of Buffalo Sabres games as well too. Yeah, it's, it's kind of nice uh, being up there, and uh, it's uh, you know one of the better parts of when Binghamton was obviously in the American Hockey League. You had obviously the Crunch and the Rochester Americans. You had Utica Comets uh, later on, and everything um, before the whole switchover uh, from the from what they used to be to being the Devils affiliate. You know, you Wilkes Bear. Uh, Allentown came into play and everything was a great just regional um, aspect but obviously pro hockey especially minor pro hockey in the northeast has changed a lot over the years uh, something that I'm very familiar with and everything how did you get hooked up with you know coach Sherwood and the Binghamton Black Bears uh, was it a phone call by you phone call by them how did I know he finds the SUNY guys like he pulls stuff out of his hat, you know, or, or he tells me, oh, well, I know this coach for this reason or anything. How did the, how did you and the Black Bears get hooked up? So I was, uh, the end of the season had come at Brockport, and I was trying desperately to get my foot in the door uh, in pro hockey one way or another. I tried to do it solo, and it just wasn't, uh, wasn't working out. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I did get an offer from Delaware, but I ended up turning it down and just seeing what uh, – what was going on there? I just didn't think I was ready to uh, to jump into that sort of situation. But uh, so I reached out to an old junior coach of mine uh, who was a coach in the ECHL, and uh, he linked me up with a, a friend of his who was an agent, and he was able to. Uh, I think he was able to contact Sherwood through the idea that I was a SUNY guy and he knew he liked his SUNY guys. And he does. We started talking after that. It was uh, it was fairly quick where I said uh, if I'm going to be uh, playing in the FPHL, then absolutely I'll be in Binghamton. Uh, being a, a first year guy, you're always going to think highly enough of yourself that you could still contact uh, every FPHL team, and maybe one of them will uh, will give you a heads up. But it's very quickly you learn that this level, the FPHL, is more than uh, a challenge in its own right. So it, don't. Uh, don't sneeze at it in a way. It's not the, it's not the fed of the past where you hear these horror stories mm-hmm. of, of how it's uh, how it's slap shot just in real life. It's uh, it's a real league, and it's it was uh, it was interesting to learn that, especially to uh, after kind of only hearing from word of mouth from uh, from Coach Sherwood that no 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 trust me you're. Uh, this is where you would like to be if you're going to be here. Well, it's funny you say that because obviously I, I don't know. I'm sure you know of him, uh, Travis Ridgen, who has his own podcast and mm. YouTube channel, has talked highly about uh, badly his experience was here in the Fed. He played for Watertown, got traded to Port Huron before getting traded back down to, uh, uh, to, down to Mississippi. He spent some time in Motor City. And he he has nothing but bad experience to talk about and everything. Um, and he's a goaltender, and he's trying to do what you're doing and what Sam is doing and what Connor's doing and everything. So for the fans who listen to my show, who have watched his broadcast and hear all these horror stories about the Fed, tell us the worst thing and the best thing that's happened to you while being in Binghamton with the Fed. Uh, well, I guess we'll start with the uh, the best thing. I mean, sure. it was, it'll it'll be a uh, certainly an all time life experience. But that home opener uh, yeah. against Elmira, the game I uh, started, just to see the uh, the genuine passion of the fans, uh, both before, during, and then, especially after the game. Uh, you know, you're riding high off a win, and uh, you're about to take your gear off before uh, before one of the veterans says. Uh, Rookies, get your jerseys back on. Go start signing some autographs. And you're like, excuse me, autographs? People want those from us? Yeah. <laughs> and then you head out and you see uh, not only were they there just to enjoy the game, but they genuinely uh, take an interest in you. And it's it's extremely gratifying to see that sort of thing. You- so that alone 
just makes the whole experience worth so it. So were you generally surprised when Kirkby or whoever came to you and said, uh, no, get your jersey back on. There's people out there that want to you know, get your autograph or picture or something like that. Were you generally just surprised? You, you, you had no idea that hockey in Binghamton was like that? I was completely, uh, completely surprised. It was not... Uh... It was not a matter of not thinking Binghamton wasn't a hockey town or anything sure. like that. I had known the history uh, behind it, but there was just the idea that, uh, well, you know, the fans will come here, enjoy the game, have a few beers, bring their kids, that sort of thing, and then they'll they'll go home mm-hmm. uh, just because we're we're relatively low minor league hockey players. I can't imagine that they would be that interested in us particularly, but. Uh, they proved me wrong. So, so let me ask you this. All right, you know, Trav says, you know, this is you know a horrible place to play the league wise and everything. What has been the more difficult or your worst experience, so to speak? You know, you don't have to throw anyone under the bus or anything. But have you had an experience that you would say, "Oh my God, this is this is the fad," right? Uh, nothing negative. I would never. Uh... Well, A, I would never throw anyone under the bus. Right. B, it helps that being here in Binghamton, there's very little to complain about when it comes to uh, things going wrong. Everything's handled so professionally here. The only thing I could say uh, where we, where I think I turned to Sam and just kind of looked at him and said, like, where are we right now, was, uh, <laughs> was the second game in uh, Carolina where uh, just the, the anger boiled over and we, uh, the first, real like line brawl mm. that we were watching was like, oh, okay, here's the, uh, this is the minor league experience right now, <laughs> especially knowing we were about to hop on the bus for another, uh, 10, 12 hours on the way back. That's when it started to feel like, okay, this is, this is certainly minor league hockey. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, or on, on the flip side was, was Connor dressing, uh, as a forward that one game that was really like, okay, this is, uh, but, but this, is, this would not happen anywhere else. But 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 Nolan, the great thing about that was is all three of you guys got to dress in the same game, right? I mean, that had to be a really cool experience for you, Connor and Sam, to be able to, to be sitting there and going, oh, "Okay, wait, uh, why is he dressing? Um, what, what's he doing? Uh, he doesn't have goalie pads. What, what's going on here? You guys must have like been like, hey, this is a pretty special moment." Oh, absolutely. Like I said, I was not saying it as a, uh, a disparaging thing whatsoever. Yeah. It was entirely just a matter of, uh, well, Connor's extremely talented, both with and without the gear sure. on. That's one of the reasons why he's such a strong puck-handling goaltender. But uh, the circumstances leading up to it, we were all kind of joking the two, three weeks prior, like, yeah, we got to get him on the lineup at some point, serve a penalty or something <laughs> if we're feeling like uh, we just don't have enough guys out there. Yeah. And then it got to the point of, like, well, we've – I don't. There's no reason to sign someone for one game. We may as well use the uh, the the one goaltender who's uh, who's capable of filling some space on the bench. And so, it was uh, as the game time is rolling along, like you're like, oh my god, we're actually going to do this. And it it was very fun to have all three of the goaltenders getting dressed for the game for once because we do in practice all sit next to each sure. other, chat that yeah. sort of thing, but. During game time, the goaltender is not dressed, isn't really supposed to be in the locker room, so you lose that three-person dynamic. And to have it back for one game was uh, was special. When I talked to Connor earlier in the year, he said the three of you guys have, have become really close. How how close have you, are you guys? You know, the, the three of you obviously are competing for the same job, essentially, right? And, you know, obviously you guys have all been on this team all season long and everything. And Brant has really kind of stuck to his word. He's like, Bob, I'm going to try to keep these three guys all season long and everything. How close has that made you guys? And are you guys also really competitive to try to get those game starts as well? So this is, I could say without a doubt, this is the favorite goalie tandem of my entire career. Uh, It is really special to say when you could be friends with, the other goaltenders on your team. Not to say that uh, I haven't been before. I've absolutely been friends with uh, different goalie partners. Like, uh, well, back in Brockport, I really liked both my my goalie partners. Mm-hmm. But this is a different sort of relationship where things are a bit more cutthroat. So the fact that we were able to bond the way we have has made it a bit more special. And that we uh, 
we know the realities of pro hockey where if things go wrong for too long, one of us or one or all three of us could be gone. But, uh, yeah. but no, we're friends off the ice in a way that uh, I don't think I've ever had before. Uh, me and Sam are actually uh, doing movie night later tonight. Uh, oh, cool. So what are you guys going to watch? The only reason I need to cut you off. Uh, I think he wants, I think we both agreed on Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, fun. Hey, listen, you guys got to have a fun movie and stuff like that. You know, that's, that's always kind of important. Um, before I let you go and everything, uh, I want to ask you this. You have played, um, obviously the least amount of games. And so there's a lot of time in between. How do you keep yourself ready so when coach does call your number, you're ready to play in that game? Uh, I think it's a matter of not changing your routine at any point, whether or not things are going well or poorly for you. If you keep a same, a same sort of attitude, regardless of what the on-ice circumstances are, you're right. just as ready as you would be if you were the guy going in every, every weekend or every other weekend. Uh, I think it's funny also that D3 Hockey was able to teach me uh, I, I think for most uh, goaltenders, you'll find that in D3, it's generally regarded that your first year, you will be the backup. There's going to be a elder statesman there in front of you who's going to get most of the games. You have to learn to grapple with that coming out of juniors, where you were probably the number one guy. So to learn that is, I think, a valuable experience later on. It's something that uh, Sam, jumping from juniors right here to pro, mm-hmm. I've had to, uh, to tell him at times, like, it's never as bad as you think it is. It's just a matter of of being ready when you're called upon again and to not not to overanalyze, just to make sure that you're still the same goaltender you were at your high as you are at what you perceive to be your low. Now, uh, when you when what 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 would you say for the three of you is the goal this season? Um, obviously you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of players and I've asked a lot of the, uh, the skaters, you know, this same question, but for goaltenders, is it a little bit different? Um, what is the goal for you guys? Uh, for us, it's still championship or bust. I mean, I know it's a cliche to answer, but it is cliche for a reason. We do genuinely believe in this group. Otherwise I think, uh, I don't think all three of us would have stayed here at our, at our low points. We probably would have sure. said like, well, get me somewhere where I'm going to play some more, but no, we all, uh, we're all going towards the common goal of, at the end of this year, being able to lift a trophy together and say we did it from day one to the final day of the season. It's something that's special, and I don't think you could really ever recapture if uh, if you're on a journeyman-style team where whatever the last roster happens to be is the one that, that goes all the way. It doesn't really feel the same, you know? Two more things, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I promise this is it. Um, the one thing I'll is take your time. a trip back from Motor City to Elmira. The game does not go your guys' way in Elmira. What is the bus rides like back when it's a loss like that? You guys haven't had many. So, uh, you know, let the fans in. What is the bus trip like back from Motor City to Elmira and then from Elmira to Binghamton? So the trip from Motor City to Elmira is a different uh, a different sort of thing where we're all just we're gassed and we understand the fact that we still have another game to play the next day. So everyone's trying to get what little sleep they can on the bus. Mm-hmm. So luckily we were able to to stop the, I forgot the town, but we Jamestown. were able to stop in a hotel and get about four, uh, five hours of sleep before we just drove straight to Elmira for the game. So it felt like it was, despite how close it was to Binghamton, it was still within the same sort of bus trip. But, uh, you know, you just do your best to try and collect yourself and to, know you're gonna to have to muscle out another game yeah. uh i wasn't dressed for that game so my idea of the locker room atmosphere was a little different from everyone else like mm-hmm. you hear everyone trying to rile themselves up and get ready for it but uh and i think we were doing well the first half of the game but i think we just finally ran out of steam where just the mental and physical toll really caught up to us in a way we weren't expecting gotcha and and lastly before i let you go I, I have to ask you, how was your first time doing color commentary when you got to do it with uh, Brooks? Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed your input um, and how you were able to, you know, kind of add to the broadcast. How about for you? What was it like? 
Uh, it was an interesting experience. Uh, as I was getting ready for it, I was probably a bit more nervous uh, than I would have been for a game I was starting just because of the unfamiliarity with it. But uh, the same way you ease into a game as a player, I kind of eased into the situation where as long as I wasn't saying uh, anything I wasn't supposed to be saying, you kind of have to turn off the hockey speak in a way where you switch Sometimes. from uh, locker room banter to a bit more professional standards uh, and not trying to – at the same time, you are still a player on the team, so you're not trying to – to overly criticize teammates or, or to, and I think if people got a kick out of me trying to avoid talking about the refereeing at any point, because <laughs> I don't want to make any enemies for <laughs> potentially what I'm playing. No, but, it, uh, it, it was a special experience. It's it's that's just so very true and everything. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I I I remember in the two thousands, Jan Hebert was a uh, referee, and I was doing color commentary for Grady Whitberg here in Binghamton, and uh, we were to, supposed to go to commercial. Grady just starts yelling at Jan Hebert as he's uh, skating off the ice at the end of one of the periods. Uh, Jean Hebert, sorry, and uh, I just remember thinking to myself, Grady, we're not supposed to. You're on the air still, dude. <laughs> you got to calm down and everything. <laughs> and this is like the guy who's been here forever. He, you know, he was there for the Calder Cup and everything. And he's just like yelling at the guy. It's just like, oh, my God. It's hilarious because you, you just you, – you, it's a different experience being up there doing that. And I, I give props uh, for anyone to be able to do it and everything. Um, Nolan, thank you very much for coming on. We totally appreciate it. And uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know you. That's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. If you're a Binghamton hockey fan, then you need to check out BinghamtonHockey.net. For all your news, stats, information, the Binghamton Hockey Hall of Fame, top 10 lists, profiles, and so much more. That's BinghamtonHockey.net. You're listening to the Power Play Post Show. And welcome back, everybody, to the Power Play Post Show. Thank you very much to Nolan Egbert for coming on and talking to us. Uh, he and I had a lot of things uh, kind of in common. He's a bass player. I'm a guitar player. We both like uh, Pink Floyd and, uh, you know, just the, the hard rock, heavy metal from the 70s and 80s. Uh, so it was pretty cool to get to talk to him a little bit about that, even off air um, as well. So I really want to thank him for coming on and talking to us. Now, the Power Play Post Show is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music and iHeartRadio. Just search Power Play Post Show on whichever platform you use and subscribe. Please join the Power Play Post Show Facebook group. Just go to Facebook and search for Power Play Post Show and share with um, all of your friends as well. Uh, check out the BinghamtonHockey.net for all your Binghamton Hockey information and curiosity. And thanks to Rob Lopolis, our MC, John Petitucci, our musical director, and Binghamton Black Bears netminder, Nolan Egbert. I am Bob Howard. Thanks for listening to the Power Play Post Show. for listening to this edition of the Power Play Post Show. Be sure to tune in next week to the Box Studios Radio Network for all the latest Black Bears news and interviews from around minor league hockey. The Power Play Post Show would like to thank John Patitucci for all the music you hear on the show. You've been listening to the Power Play Post Show.